Good morning, Foothill Church. Today's scripture is found in Exodus 15, verses 22 to 27. Please stand for the word of the Lord. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Merah, they could not drink the water of Merah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Merah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. This is God's word. You may be seated. Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. A woo, a little faint woo in the back there. (laughs) Nice. Uh, All right, well, we are in our uh, series in Exodus and uh, continuing on. And uh, we've come to this uh, section where if we were, if this was a a film, a movie, um, this would be kind of a turning point in the film. Um, We've followed the story of uh, the people of God. There are 400 years of slavery in Egypt. God moving dramatically uh, to rescue them. Uh, They've just crossed the Red Sea. God destroying their enemies. Last week we saw this uh, worship service break out. There were tambourines, and uh, which seems appropriate. Today's uh, Pentecost Sunday, so for those with a Pentecostal streak, those are the wooers probably in the room (laughs) at the minute. Uh, This is your Sunday, so uh, (laughs) so. Break out the tambourine if you have one, I guess. Uh, Hey, nice. (laughs) Look at that, right on cue. Nice. Love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Awesome. Uh, What was I saying? I kind of lost my place now. (laughs) Oh, yes. So they were uh, celebrating, and now um, we start to journey into the wilderness. And we're going to really, this section is their orientation uh, to get ready for the wilderness, if you will. So, um, I, if anybody gone through an orientation, maybe you start a new job or college. Uh, my wife and I, when we lived in Ireland, were invited by friends. They had a timeshare in the French Alps uh, to come over for a long weekend, and you don't turn that down, obviously. So, we said yes, and we went. And one of the things we did was we went white water rafting, um, and I'd never done that before. Uh, but they give you an orientation because it's kind of dangerous and uh, you get in your wetsuit, your helmet, they give you an oar and the boat while you're still on dry land. <laughs> so you're not even in the water yet and they get you in and they're like, hey, this is where you put your feet and there's little, little hooks that you put your feet in. This is when I give this command, row this way so we can turn this way. When I give this command, turn this way. And uh, if you fall out of the boat, this is what you do. If someone else falls out of the boat, this is what we will all do so that that person doesn't drown and die. And so we had this like full orientation, safety orientation before we could get in the water and uh, t- so that we lived. And essentially this is what this passage is today. This is Israel's orientation into the wilderness. They don't know they're going to be there for 40 years, uh, but the Lord does and he's preparing them for them. And so this morning, uh, I hope uh, our, our sermon is very practical, um, not just looking at the lessons they learned, but for us as well. As a matter of fact, uh, the Apostle Paul will write to the church in Corinth, looking back to the Exodus, and write this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and drank the same spiritual drink, For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Now we'll come back, we'll come back to that. We should all be always be looking for Jesus in the text, even if we're in the Old Testament. Um, But he says, nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place 
as an example for us that we might not desire evil as they did. So Paul says, hey, this, this is recorded in history for our instruction, for our benefit, that we might learn something from them, that we don't fall into the same trap uh, that they did. Uh, God wasn't pleased with them. Most of them were overthrown in the wilderness. And so we're gonna look at the passage today kind of in three stages. And I think we'll see a lesson or a point of application from each one of those stages that we look at. And so let's dive right in um, and begin. Uh, The first stage that we're gonna see is there's no water, no water. The Lord is asking them, uh, the Lord so far has made himself known to them. He saved them. He's delivered them. And now comes the hard part, following him, trusting him. And, And this is what I want us to see. Following God takes faith, not just a, a, a faith, the, a saving faith for sure, um, but it, it, it takes continual faith to follow the Lord. If we were to boil down the word faith, really, it, it means to trust. The Lord is asking his people to trust him. Uh, the psalmist would, will say that God's word, his, his instructions to us, the way he reveals himself specifically is a lamp unto his feet. It's a light to his path. And that's a good thing, but it's also frustrating because what I want is the Bible to be like Google Maps. Here's the entire course of your destination. Here's exactly how long it's gonna take. It's gonna get a little bit delayed, obviously in LA with traffic or an accident, but, but, but I know the whole route. I know the whole plan. I know exactly my arrival time and destination. And yet that's not how God works. It's a light to your path and your feet. You get a few steps at a time. And this is what we're gonna see here. God is leading them, asking them to trust him, and there's no water. It's interesting in verse 22, the language that's used, then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea. They're there, they're wanting to celebrate. Um, There was much to celebrate. It was rightfully, they were there to worship and honor what God had done. But it seems like Moses had to make them get up and go. It's so easy, isn't it, to stay on Sunday morning? Um, we come here week after week to be encouraged, to be instructed, to, to repent, to confess, to worship God, to break bread together. And yet, the Lord sends us back out. There's still Monday to Saturday. We don't live uh, as Sabbath every day. It's, it's every six days we get a day of rest on the seventh. God has only just begun to work out the story of his people and he has maturing to do in them and in us. See, God has always wanted a people to reveal himself to and to reveal himself through. They weren't just saved from something, but they were saved for something. God had a plan for his people and he needed to prepare them to to work out that plan. And so three days, they're out in a journey in the wilderness, and now there's no water. God has led them out here, and they don't even have what they need to live. Um, Water, after oxygen, is probably the the second most important thing you need to live. Uh, There's kind of a rule of thumb that says you can go about three days under kind of normal circumstances without water, and then bad stuff starts to happen to your body. But this isn't even normal circumstances. They're out in the desert, in the, in, the, in the beating sun, on foot, walking out through here, and they've run out of the one thing they need to live. Imagine that scene. I'm sure um, livestock is with them. They don't have enough water. Livestock starts to slow down, maybe refuses to walk. You got kids with you like hundreds of thousands of kids. Now, parents, what are your kids like when they're thirsty and can't get a drink of water? You've been in the car on a road trip with your kids? I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. And you're like, we're not stopping. And then eventually you stop because you want them to stop. They start to grumble and complain. What's the thirstiest you've ever been? I can remember a couple times in my life, but one particularly stands out. Uh, on a backpacking trip in Colorado. It was about 20 years ago. I was leading a group and we had summited one of the 14,000 uh, footers 
and we were trying to make good time coming back down. And so we hiked long and hard all day, set up our camp in the, in the dark, which is usually not advised, but we did. Had ramen noodles for dinner. So that's gonna make you thirsty. It's all full of sodium. I had sweat everything out and I was dehydrated. Um, and I was in my tent trying to go to sleep and um, maybe I'd woken up uh, in, in my sleep and my tongue was cracked. You ever have like that? And I couldn't even produce saliva. I was that dehydrated. I, 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 I couldn't go back to sleep. I couldn't think about anything else. I needed water. Now I had a flask, uh, but I didn't have any water. So I had to, I had to get out of my tent. Uh, hope there weren't any wildlife there. Go down to the creek, fill it up. But I had to put purification tablets in it. And those take about a half an hour to, to do their job. So I go back to my tent. I lay down, check the time. Okay, I got a half an hour. And I'm like, don't look at your watch. It's gonna take forever. Just try to, you know, wait out a half an hour. And I, I laid there and I laid there and I'm like, it's gotta have been like 20 minutes, 25 minutes. I'm getting close. It'd been like five minutes. And I was like, forget it. I can't, <laughs> I'm like, I don't care if there's parasites in this water or not. And I just chugged the whole thing. And just the relief of just that, I was just parched. I couldn't think about anything else. It completely dominated uh, my life in that moment until I could get relief. And this is what's happening. They're running out of water in the desert and they begin to grumble. They begin to complain. Now think of all they've just experienced over the last few months and weeks and days. They've seen God send a deliverer in Moses. They've watched God exercise his might through 10 plagues. They've experienced the Passover. They've plundered Egypt. Like here, take our gold, our silver. Here's clothing for you as you leave. The whole dramatic Red Sea experience the power of God uh, exercised over their enemies and nature itself. And it took three days. Three days to forget all of that and start to grumble and complain. What's going on, Moses? Where are we going, Moses? What are we supposed to drink, Moses? Where are you leading us? Following God takes faith. It is an exercise in trust. If you're like me, um, I, one thing that, that disturbs my soul the most is uncertainty. I, I don't cope well. I struggle to cope with uncertainty. I can suffer. I can go through pain if I know how long it's going to last. It's the unknown. It's the uncertainty um, that really, really bothers me. And this is, this is why slavery in Egypt is so attractive. You're like, how could someone start to pine for the good old days of slavery? But it's certain. As a slave, your days are pretty certain. Okay, it, it might not be a, a, a pleasurable experience, but at least you have food and water. At least you know the extent and the type of suffering that you're gonna endure. Think of the pain of childbirth. Well, at least for the ladies. I've, I've witnessed it, not experienced it. But that's a different kind of going to the hospital, isn't it? Going to the hospital to have a baby, you know it's gonna be painful. You know you're gonna have to endure uh, some suffering there, but you know it's for a certain amount of time and then it's over and you get this amazing reward and then God gives you the female's hormones to kind of make you forget the pain so that you have another one. <laughs> Tricky, Right? Now that's a different kind of going to the hospital than getting thrown in the back of an ambulance, not being able to breathe and having chest pains. You're going to the hospital with a different kind of anxiety, are you not? Because it's the unknown. It's the uncertainty of what's coming. They had a faith issue. They were weak in their trust in who God was. I wonder, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, as he looks back at Exodus, Exodus, by the way, is the event uh, of the Old Testament th that's mentioned more than any other in the New Testament. This is a critical foundational um, event in the life of the people of God. I wonder, as Paul's going through being shipwrecked, being beaten and left for dead, snake bitten, imprisoned, even given his life, I wonder if he, how much he thought back to these events to strengthen his faith and trust in, in God. And that's what he's asking us to do too. So they start to grumble. Now, 
What do we do with pain in our life? When we're tempted to grumble and complain, what, what the text is not asking us to do is just act like everything's fine, sweep it under the rug, and uh, put on a brave face, and uh, you know, put on that Sunday smile and act like everything's fine. It's actually the opposite. Peter would tell us in 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. So we're recognizing who God is. And at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. God wants us to bring our troubles, our anxieties, our complaints, if you will. We see the psalmist do this often. But we do that in a, in a way that is different from grumbling and complaining. We could say it this way. There's a difference between groaning and grumbling. We can groan. The Bible says all of creation is groaning, waiting for the Lord to return. Israel's sin wasn't bringing worries to the Lord. That's understandable. We should, we're commanded to. But bringing them in a grumbling, accusatory, faithless way. It'd be like you as a parent, maybe buying your child a bike, right? You've, you've given them this gift. They go out on the bike and uh, they, they take a tumble off the bike. They cut their knee, cut their elbow. They come in scraped up, crying. But instead of coming in looking for comfort, they come in with a, a accusatory spirit. This is your fault. You bought the bike. You're the one who gave me the bike. It's your, if, if you hadn't given me the bike, I wouldn't have fallen off in the first place. And that's very different, isn't it, than coming in needing comfort, allowing a parent to bind your wounds, drawing you in. We can cry out to the Lord. As a matter of fact, what does Moses do? Moses cries out to the Lord. It's amazing that his cry out to the Lord solves the problem and all of the grumbling doesn't do anything. This last 18 months, the season of COVID has been marked with uncertainty, has it not? How have you done in the wilderness? As I look back and examine the last 18 months of my life, or even the last few years, I've, if there's one thing that my life has been marked with over the last three years, it's been uncertainty. I haven't always passed that test. There have been times of grumbling in my soul. This isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I, this isn't the way that uh, I, I thought the GPS was gonna lead. And yet, when I look back, the Lord has been there the whole time. Kevin DeYoung says, we often grumble when past provision and future promise have no bearing on our present pain. That's what's happened uh, exactly with, with the people of Israel. They've forgotten the Lord's past provision. His, his miracle working through the, through the, uh, the plagues, his demonstration at the Red Sea. His provision for them as they leave uh, plundering the Egyptians. And they've forgotten his future promises. They're literally going to a place called the promised land. And neither of those have any bearing on their present pain. Following the Lord takes faith. It takes trust. And these are opportunities, these times in the wilderness or unsure, or there doesn't seem to be any water. What I actually need are opportunities to press in even closer. The second phase that we see then is bitter water. We're gonna see that following God requires testing. Now notice they're three days into the wilderness. That number's not a coincidence. Do you remember when Moses approached Pharaoh, what did he ask? He asked, let my people go so that we can go three days into the wilderness to sacrifice and worship the Lord. So the expectation is three days out into the wilderness, we should be worshiping. We should be sacrificing. We should be doing all of this. And instead, there hasn't been any water. And now we find water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. Mara literally means bitter. And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord. The Lord showed him a log or a tree and he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. 
There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. And there he tested them saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord, your God, do what is right in his eyes, give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians for I am the Lord, your healer, your healer. So we're three days in, this should be where we're sacrificing, we're worshiping the Lord, we've, we've had no water, we finally come to water and it's undrinkable. It's bitter. Which kind of begs the question, doesn't it? Why did the Lord lead them here? Why did he lead them to Mara? Why get them to a place of need, lead them to a place where they thought that need was gonna be met, only to have those hopes dashed. Why not lead them straight to Elam with the springs of water and the palm trees, this oasis? And I think we'll see from the text two reasons. The first one is he's teaching them. The Lord is teaching them. Again, back to our rafting orientation. Um, if you do this, if I say this, you do this. If I say this, you do this. And if you'll do those things, if you follow my commands, you're not gonna drown. This is exactly what he's given them. He's given them instruction. Notice the four things that he, uh, the lessons that he wants them to learn, that he's teaching them. Diligently listen to God's voice. Diligently listen. Do what is right in his eyes. Third, give ear or pay attention to his commands and keep all of his statutes. That's the Lord saying, you do this and I will do this. If you'll follow my commands, I will be your healer. Obedience always brings blessing. Disobedience brings judgment. This is seen throughout scripture. This is right back to the Garden of Eden, is it not? Hey, you can eat of any tree you want to, except for this one. And if you'll disobey and eat of that tree, it's gonna bring judgment. It's gonna bring death. This is the plagues of Egypt. Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He's stiff-necked. He won't give in. And it brings judgment. It brings death. And it's a lesson that we need to learn too. Obedience brings blessing. That doesn't mean that we go through life without any kind of pain. Um, we'll, we'll see this uh, later on. It doesn't mean that this isn't prosperity gospel, that if you do follow God, then your life is just gonna be perfect. Not at all. But the trajectory of our life, things, even non-Christians, when they live lives according to the principles of God, um, moral, they're honest, they're upright. You don't have to even be a believer. Your life generally goes better when we follow God's ways. So he's teaching them. The second thing that we see is he's testing them. He's testing them. This idea of test in the scripture, it's revealing something. Uh, an illustration that's used throughout the scripture is that of testing of gold. And how they would test gold is they'd put it in a refinery and they would melt it down and all the impurities would be revealed. They would come to the top so they could skim off the impurities to make it gold, uh, to make it pure. This is what God is doing. He's revealing something to them. He's asking them the question, do you want to be like Egypt and their gods, stiff-necked, doing their own way, rejecting my way, and thus receiving judgment, or will you trust and obey me? Notice the test. It's very, very similar to the very first plague. And he says, if you'll obey me, I won't put the same diseases, I won't put the same plagues on you. But this first test is, is the same as the first plague. It's undrinkable water. They have water, they just can't drink it. It's of no use to them. Now, we might think we're better than uh, the Israelites. You're like, okay, here we are. We're at a water. It's, we've got a place of water and it's undrinkable. But hang on. Yahweh's with us. We've been here before. He can turn water into blood. He can turn blood back into water. The Lord can provide. The Lord can take care of us. The Lord can do that. But that's not what happens, is it? That memory is so short. Our memory is so short of the goodness of God, of what he's done in our life, his faithfulness to us. We forget. 
So much so that they would create monuments. They would stack rocks. They would make these Ebenezers, if you will, so that the next generation would be like, hey, what's up with all these stacked rocks? And we would tell them of the faithfulness of God. We do the same, right? We create monuments to heroes, to our past, to our history, so that other generations might know our story. Instead of trusting them, and instead of trusting him, they begin to grumble. They have short-sightedness, bad memories. And so God tests them. And here's the thing, there is no shortcuts to the promised land. There is no shortcuts to glory. We get tested in the wilderness to make us more like the people that can go into the promised land. Even Jesus, when he comes, how does he begin his public ministry? 40 years, 40, 40 years, 40 days in the wilderness, being tested. And if our savior has to go through a wilderness experience, we follow him, we go through the same thing. And so it, it, it tests us, it teaches us, but this should give us hope because it gives us the right perspective, right? We understand that hard times will come. We shouldn't be surprised when we enter into wilderness times. Jesus himself told us this in John 16, 33. He says, I've said these things to you that in me you might have peace. So where does your peace come from? It's not your circumstances. It's in, it's in Jesus himself. And then he says this, in the world you will have tribulation. You will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. <laughs> There's nothing that, that, that can take you out of the peace of Christ. His half-brother James would instruct us when it comes to tribulations as well. James 1, 2 to 4, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. And why would you be joyful to be tried in your faith? He says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. When we pass those tests, it reveals to us that our faith is real. It's genuine. It's steadfast. It's not fake. And let steadfastness have, have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. We think the test has us lacking something and it's the opposite. Our tests and trials are there to produce something in us, to reveal to us that what we actually need isn't what we think we need. When we have Christ, we have all that we need. God often uses the wilderness he uses the, the Mara places, these bitter places to reveal the bitterness in our own hearts. Do you remember the story of Ruth and Naomi? Um, Naomi loses everything. She loses her husband, her sons. Basically, she's a widow now with no one to take care of her. She's very vulnerable. And uh, Ruth says, calls her Naomi and she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. She was bitter in her spirit. There's a lack of faith and trust that God would provide, that God would protect. God often uses the wilderness to reveal what's in our heart and to prepare us for the promised land. And it's to remind us that this is not our home. We are not home yet. We're in the wilderness. Our whole life, this side of heaven is that. And when we remember that, it gives us the right perspective. We spend less time fighting culture wars in a place that isn't ours anyway. We pour our energy into being a faithful witness of the life that we've been promised. And then the third and, and final act of, of the story here is springs of water. No water, bitter, bittersweet water, and now springs of water. So God reveals himself. He, he makes the bitter water sweet. They're able to drink. And then from there, he moves them on to Elam. Verse 27, he says, Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Now notice the numbers that are quoted here. These aren't accidents. There's 12 springs. How many, 12, how many, how many tribes of Egypt are there? There's 12. Each spring providing for a tribe. 70 palm trees. We'll see shortly how many elders are, are set up to, to help govern uh, the people of Israel. 70. 
you can go too far into numerology and get a little bit weird and kooky, but I think what's happening here is this, is this symbol, the symbolism of God's provision for all of his people. He sees them all, all 12 tribes, all divisions into 70. It's this sign of completeness and wholeness of them. He is there to, to, to be known to all of them. He leads them into a place of complete provision for their needs. He is their healer. He knows them. He knows exactly what they need. He leads them into a place where all of their needs are met. And this is their orientation for the wilderness because this little period here is a microcosm of what the next 40 years is gonna be for them. It ends up being this back and forth between Mara and Elam. Places of, of bitterness, uh, of mistrust, of grumbling towards God, mistrust in their leaders, uh, 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 undermining uh, their leaders and in, in, in pining back for slavery and God providing exactly what they need, revealing who he is, bringing them back into places of Elam again. <coughs> Elam is this taste. It's a foreshadowing of the promised land that they will enter in due time after a period of teaching, of testing, of refining, of maturing, of growing their faith. Chris has mentioned it before, but it, God isn't just getting them out of Egypt. Now he's got to get Egypt out of them. And it's going to take 40 years, unfortunately. They weren't ready for the promised land yet. They needed to grow and mature and trust and faith and obedience. But this is also our picture of redemption. This is a picture of how you and I um, follow Jesus. It's how we get led into flourishing, into salvation. Notice their story in these acts. They're in Egypt, no water, no life, slaves to sin and death. That's us before our rescue by Christ. And then God sends them salvation through a mediator, Moses. For us, it's Jesus, the, the true and better Moses, leads us out of, saves us out of. We enter into this wilderness period of the rest of our life, this side of heaven, being refined, learning who God is, walking closer with him, the spirit revealing um, our imperfections, uh, living a life of repentance, a life of sanctification. All of that happens in the wilderness. And then finally entering into the eternal rest. We have these moments of Elam in the wilderness Mara is to make life sanctifying and Elam is to make life bearable. And our life is a mixture of bitter and sweet. And then finally entering into the promised land, the eternal rest uh, in the presence of God himself. And notice how Jesus does it for us. Jesus takes the path in reverse. He starts off in the presence of God. He starts off in heaven, in the presence of his father. And from there, he enters into the wilderness. He takes on, the fle on, on flesh, becomes human, goes into wilderness, becomes our savior like Moses was for Israel, a mediator, and enters into death. We start in death and end in the presence. Jesus left the presence of God, went through the wilderness, became our savior to enter into death for us. Now, the good news is, is we, we, have, we have no power over death. Jesus enters into death and takes the keys to death and hell itself, overcomes death, resurrects from the, from the grave so that you and I might have eternal life. So the question that I want us to think about as we end is where are you? What does the last 18 months look like in your life? Where are you? Maybe you're here today and you're not, you're like, I'm not even a Christian. Um, uh, I'm, I'm in Egypt, if you will. I'm still in slavery. I'm, I haven't even been rescued from my own self yet. And if that's you today, man, I, I just want to encourage you that Jesus is, is longing for you uh, to trust him, to lead you out of Egypt. We go through the Red Sea, as you, if you will, in baptism. We come out the other side as part of the people of God. And that is a free offer to, to you today. We'd love to talk to you more about that. Maybe you're a believer this morning. Maybe you're already a part of the people of God, but 
Maybe you've been camping at Mara for a while. That bitterness, drinking that bitter water. We can become angry. We can become disillusioned. Start to deconstruct our faith into nothingness. We refuse to learn the lessons of the wilderness. The writer of Hebrews gives us a warning about this in Hebrews 12. He says, therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. God is our healer. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it, many become defiled. Do you see the contrast there? You can receive, you can obtain the grace of God, which is a free gift to you through Christ, or we become embittered. This root of bitterness takes, takes uh, hold. That, that idea of this like root of bitterness, you remember the, the parable of the four soils, what, what starts to grow, the weeds choke it out. This root of bitterness can choke out our faith. It causes trouble. We become defiled. Bitterness left unchecked can wreak havoc in our life. Life is difficult. The wilderness is not an easy place. It requires faith. It requires trust. It requires our faith being tested. But if we'll have faith and follow Christ, it leads us to places of flourishing. And can I encourage us this morning, if we find Mara in our heart, this bitterness in our heart, maybe it's the uncertainty of the last year and a half. Maybe your life isn't where you thought it would be right now. We can become embittered and angry towards the Lord in that. Let me encourage us to learn the lessons that the Lord was teaching them. Diligently listen to God's voice. I know during times of uncertainty when I'm angry at God, the last thing I want to do is l diligently listen to him, right? You, you remember what it's like being a kid or if you're a teenager or if you're parents of some, like when you're mad at your parents, the last thing you want to do is listen to them. That's why you run off and slam a door. <laughs> like, can I encourage you to quiet our spirit this morning and diligently listen to his voice? Do what's right in his eyes. Give ear and pay attention to his commandments. Keep his statutes. There was an old hymn when I was a kid growing up we used to sing called Trust and Obey. Old school hymn. Maybe you've heard it or sang it if you've been in church a long time. But it's really true. The lines of it say, trust and obey because there's no other way. There's no better way to be happy in Jesus, to have joy in our life, to have that peace that Jesus offered than to trust and obey. Jesus is inviting you this morning to come and drink of the well of Elam. That well is Jesus himself. Do you remember the woman at the well who asked Jesus for this drink? And he, he answers, he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, he asked her for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Living water is the life of Christ himself. Have you received that this morning? This invitation isn't new to the New Testament. This is the invitation of God to his people um, from the beginning. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 55, this, is, this uh, section entitled, The Compassion of the Lord, says, Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's a free gift that God offers us to come and drink deeply of the well of living waters that we find in Christ. We also see contours of the gospel in this story as well because what heals the bitterness in the water is the Lord revealing to Moses a tree, a piece of wood to put into the water and it turns it from bitterness to sweet. And it's the same for us. There's a tree that heals us. The tree of Calvary has these contours of curse and healing, of bitterness and sweetness all bound up in it. We look to Jesus who hung on that tree in our place as the author, the finisher of our faith. We follow his commands. 
We follow his ways that lead us to a place of healing, of flourishing. That's our choice for us today, wherever we find ourselves. May I encourage us to do that, to look to Jesus once again, to pack up our tent, to move on from Mara to the living springs of Elam and Jesus himself. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the story that you've given us, uh, this, this history that you've given us of you and your people. Father, we confess that we, just like Israel, um, fall into the same traps. We uh, have myopic vision. It's so short-sighted. We forget uh, the past provision that you have given us. We forget your future promises uh, that you have promised to us, secured uh, those promises to us in the, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We focus so much on our present pain. And Father, we acknowledge that life is painful. Not, you don't ask us to discount that, to, to sweep it under the rug, to ignore it, but to bring our pain, to bring our anger, to bring our bitterness to you in groanings, to the healer, to the great physician. And not, not with grumbling and complaining and an accusatory spirit, Father, you actually call Satan the father of lies who accuses the brethren. It's that same accusatory spirit. Father, would you heal us from that even this morning? By your grace, would you soften our hearts that we might hear your invitation once again to come and drink. We ask this in your name. Amen.